This week on Secure Digital Life, we talk about Tor, the ever exciting browser. We talk about the deep web, the dark web, net neutrality, all this and more when we come back. Stay tuned. Welcome to Secure Digital Life. And you type in AAA porn or whatever it is you're typing in. I'm, so, I'm sorry, we, I was at a PG show. And I'm really okay. excited to be here. I'm glad you're here because somebody needs to know what's going on. That's right. Okay, so now, now somebody has to drink this. <laughs> it's another day, it's another episode. Yeah, he's looking at the wrong camera. You, oh, oh, you moved my, you put my camera over here. Eh, there you cut. Go. Basically, forget you ever saw that. I, I think actually forgetting you ever saw that would really be a good <laughs> idea at this point. Hi. This week I'm not there. It's like I'm there, but I'm not there. So I'm like looking over Russ's shoulder on a camera monitor, and I'm doing this from my secret lair because we want to talk about Tor. Now, last week on uh, the show, we talked about net neutrality, and I talked about how Tor was going to be like a thing you might use to avoid being snooped by your ISP. And so we wanted to talk a little bit about that. And one of the reasons that Tor came about at all was for browsing something that's called the deep web or the dark web. Mm -hmm. And ha have you ever used the dark web, Russ? I'm, I'm looking at Russ, who's actually sitting in front of me, sort of. So I'm, right, I'm, I'm, I'm right here. I'm right here. See, Doug, I've got your face. Oh, now right. I'm looking at him. See, yeah. he's right there. Okay, now I got him. Okay. <laughs> squeak, squeak. Um, so okay. I have not uh, surfed the dark web. Um, and yeah, big baby. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to admit that openly, um, or maybe I just did. Who knows? But uh, so the dark web and the deep web are very, very interesting concepts. And uh, only roughly, they say, only about 10% of the Internet is publicly available on the Internet. Uh, for the rest of the stuff, you need to use a, uh, a browser like Tor uh, to, to, to visit or to, to explore. And, and so there are two concepts here that I just want to talk about briefly, introduce you to, is the deep web and the dark web. And so the dark web is sort of the uh, encrypted networks that exist um, throughout uh, you know, this, this sort of sacred, uh, sacred area, which uh, are not publicly visible, you would need to use Tor for. And then the deep web is sort of the collection of databases um, that reside on uh, the, the those networks uh, that you know you could you could use toward to get to. So uh, those are the two concepts, um, you know, dark and deep. So, <laughs> well, I, I have I have you I have gone on on the deep web and the dark web. Uh, when I first started hearing about it, I just sort of immediately jumped on and said, "Okay, I'm going to check this out." And that was actually the first time I learned about Tor. Mm -hmm. Because I was like, if I'm going to go on a website that's selling heroin, yeah, and not the, the, sil not the Silk heroin, Road, the I'm Silk not, Road. But I was just, yeah. I was just curious what was going on out there because I kept reading stories about it. I was like, I'm going to use something that's going to anonymize me for sure. And that was when I first downloaded and installed Tor, mm -hmm. and I went out there and was shocked. And I'm not easily shocked, let me tell you. But I was actually shocked that all this stuff was going on uh, in reality. But there, there is apparently a lot of it's been reduced in size mm -hmm. uh, over the last uh, maybe year. I know that several different uh, large scale uh, hacker organizations targeted uh, a lot mm -hmm. of dark web uh, type mm -hmm. sites, especially ones that were doing child exploitation and, right. and, and sex trafficking and things like that. I advise you to stay away from the dark web. It's very dangerous uh, just because for every, you know, I mean, I don't know why you need to be there in the first place. Mm -hmm. And secondly, because if you do go there, there's a great deal of malware, viruses, mm -hmm. and just plain nasty people. So it's basically mm -hmm. like going down, you know, uh, to Times Square in 1976 and trying to buy drugs. Uh, you, you might get stabbed. And yeah. uh, so so that's and, going on. And, and to piggyback off that, Doug, uh, I, I love what you're saying. Um, there was the whole uh, the whole issue of anonymity associated with Tor as a, as a browser and, and the deep and dark web. Um, was uh, sort of uh, there was the shockwave that was sent through the media about what uh, two three years ago well maybe now four years ago when uh, the screen uh, named Dread Pirate Roberts who was the founder uh. Of, uh, yeah founder of the Silk Road and the Silk Road yeah. for those of you that don't know um, is a 
deep web uh, sort of network that was used for the procurement of illegal substances like, you know, uh, acid or LSD or, or whatever, or, you know, drugs. And, and so the FBI had arrested him in 2013, and everybody wondered, well, wait a minute, if Tor is supposed, supposedly an, a, anonymous, how did they find him? And so that was a big, that was a big question. Um, right. So. And, and I mean, and there's, there's always, you know, there's always mechanisms for finding people. And, and, and one of the things I, I wanted to be sure we talked about was don't assume that you're anonymous. Right. There are always ways to collect data uh, and especially at the endpoints. So if you give up your data, so you log into some site, I don't care how anonymous you are browsing wise. Mm -hmm. If you log into a site and connect to it and you give up information about yourself, whether it's bank account information or it's your personal information, your address or whatever, there you're no longer anonymous. And there's always ways to, to track things and there's always holes in it. So I went and I made a, a video, I actually made two videos I'm gonna show you, but I made a video to show you kind of how Tor works. It's just, it's a, we're gonna run that one first. So I think we'll cut to Doug, who is in this same studio some other time. How about that? <laughs> sure. Thanks, Doug and Russ, for cutting away to me from the studio. It's just like Family Guy with a clever cutaway. I bet they said something really cool to cut over. This is Doug in a different studio. I want to show you two things that you can use to try to improve your browsing habits if you, if you are concerned about it. But I also, before I do anything, I want to caution you that none of this ultimately is uh, anonymizing you. There are so many things you have to do to try to truly be anonymous on the internet. Now I've gone ahead and started a few of these things. So I'm using a virtual machine here and for whatever reason it's running kind of slow. But I want to show you how to use something that we, we talked about in the, in the show already is Tor Browser. And Tor Browser is a really cool product that is free. You can Google Tor and get to it and download it and install it. And I would show you how to do all those things, but it's so easy that I, I actually think if you're considering using Tor Browser, you can probably manage since basically it involved clicking the version you wanted, downloading it, and clicking it to install it. So it's pretty automated at this point in history. So you don't have to build anything. Now, if you want to run it on Linux or something like that, well, you know enough to, to do your own builds and all those kind of things. If you're running it on Windows, it's just basically a download file install it, and you'll have this icon on your desktop. And once you've done that, you would actually have access to this thing right here, which is Tor Browser. And they use this Onion symbol because that came from uh, Security Onion, which was another product that I think they're involved in, I think, unless it's just something random. I, onions are often used in security, if you didn't know that already. But um, they do give you a lot of information, like maximizing your browser allows them to determine your monitor size, and that can be used to track you by the size of your monitor, which is pretty paranoid in my opinion, but some people who are using these things are extremely paranoid. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it running. You can always, if you don't want to maximize it, you can drag it to some random point, although you know, I could also argue that they can track that too, so there's, there's all these settings that can be retrieved. They have added a lot of features to this to make it easy to use. It used to be kind of clunky and now it's really posh. Uh, there are two boxes down here that I want to talk about briefly and then I'm going to show you something. Um, one of them is, I'm going to explain in a separate video how Tor works, but if you want to support Tor, uh, you can be a volunteer and you can run a relay node or of course you can donate money to Tor. I don't, I don't have any involvement with Tor at all, but just in case you want to get involved. Tor is not all you need to browse anonymously. And I think that statement, and it even has an exclamation point after it, just in case you weren't, you know, you weren't excited enough. And basically what it means is that you can very easily be identified by so many features of this, by cookies, by the size of your monitor, all kinds of things. But for most people, this is going to take what you're doing and hide it from your ISP. Because essentially what happens is Tor actually goes out to a volunteer node. And I, like I said, I'm going to do a, another video to show you that. But Tor goes out to a volunteer node. And so instead of you connecting to 
triple uh, X domain or to Google or to whatever it is you're connecting to, you don't want somebody to see you connecting to, what happens is you connect to the volunteer node. And by connecting to the volunteer node, now your ISP sees only that piece of the connection and all the traffic going out of that pipe is encrypted in the VPN. So real quickly, watch if we do this right here. If I type what's my IP, this is going to show me where uh, I'm connected with Tor Browser. And we can see that I just got this IP right here. And I know that's not my IP at home. And in fact, this what's my IP search on Tor, on DuckDuckGo, which is what they're using, shows that this IP address is in Latvia. So what happened is my connection was bounced around. I connected to some volunteer node maybe near me. Oh, never fails. Some volunteer node near me. And basically then what happened was it bounced it to somewhere else, another volunteer, bounced it to somewhere else, another volunteer, and bounced it to somewhere else, and you got another volunteer. And ultimately, this is what would be seen by whoever I'm connecting to. Now my ISP is seeing something else entirely. My ISP is seeing a, bound, a, a connection going outbound to somewhere else. Probably not this one, and it's going to bounce, 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 bounce. I'll show you that in the other video. So it did protect me from that regard. So now all connections to whomever I'm connecting to show they're coming from Latvia. And that has its own set of problems in, inherent in it. Because if you try to go to Netflix, you try to go to uh, Hulu, you try to go to a lot of sites, they're going to say this is a Latvian connection. Some of them are going to block you outright. And it won't always be Latvia either. It'll be something else. So the next time you start tour, it may be you know it may be from the Ukraine or it may be from uh, Venezuela. So you don't know. It depends on where the volunteer nodes are and what the bounce goes through at that point in time. So what does it do? Well, it protects you from the ISP seeing your information, and it protects uh, the endpoint, whatever you're connecting to, from seeing the source. So they would not be able to backtrack and see where that connection came from. So if you were trying to browse, um, like I've set this up for some police people, and the police people were, I was showing them how to use it, the police people were using this for surveillance, and they were going to like uh, drug sites, and they were going to child porn sites, and they were doing things like that. And they were using uh, Tor in order to, so that the people wouldn't see that the connections that were coming to the site were from law enforcement, which would be really, really bad if you try and do undercover, you know, drug buys or undercover whatever buys. And so by doing that, it does limit you to some degree. It does not protect you in any way from giving up your own personal information or from downloading things that are harmful. So if you log into a site, so if you go to a biker drug site on the dark web, which you can get to through Tor, uh, and you, you go in there and you, you type in your name and address, they have your name and address. So don't make a mistake that this window itself is protected. If you go to a pornographic site and you download malware onto your system, which is a common thing that people end up doing, uh, that malware is still downloaded. And if you have antivirus in place, if you have malware protection in place, then maybe it'll catch it, but it still will download. So you can still download files and put them onto your main system. You can still upload files and put them uh, you know, out there for everyone to see. So don't get the idea that, that Tor in any way is protecting you from giving up personal information or receiving harmful information. All it's doing is disguising that number. So the best uh, thought about it that way is it's like uh, having a self, like having a burner phone. So if you want to call your friend and they don't know your number, that's kind of what it's doing. And it does do that level of protection and it protects you from the ISP actually uh, grabbing your information. I'm going to show you one more thing and we'll go back to the studio and I'll show you my other video which explains exactly how that works uh, to you. On Chrome and on most other browsing products, uh, we, if you want, we could go look for that location if we wanted to, but we don't need to. Most of these browsers now have incognito windows of some sort. And once again, if I click this, I get this. And it changes the way Chrome looks. And what it does is not very much. So you need to be incredibly careful here. 
I have had people ask me, I don't know what they were doing, I always think everybody's much more exciting than I am, but I have had people ask, you know, like, what happens if you use incognito? And I'm like, oh, what are you doing? But the bottom line is, and do you think, I think that looks like a car with a hat on it. I have a real problem with icons. But somebody told me it's supposed to be like a person with like dark glasses, but I'm like, yeah, okay, sure, whatever. But um, this mode, and they even warn you right here, you aren't invisible, doesn't hide your browsing from your employer, your internet service provider, or the websites that you visit. And what that means is that if I go right here, and I'm going to just type rw.edu, this is where I work, and I'm going to go to that website. The ISP, or whoever is controlling my connection, in this case it's me, the ISP is seeing that I just went to rw.edu. But here's what happens with incognito mode. Incognito basically tells it not to save any cookies. They're there. It, it fakes out the website. So the web, website will plant its cookies and its trackers and all this kind of stuff on this site, but it still has your IP address. So if I pop my IP address on here, it will pull up my IP. And it's not going to be disguised the way it was in Tor. And likewise, RWU can see where the connection came from. But any information I type here, like searches, uh, any, it won't save any information. It doesn't save the browser history. It doesn't save any passwords. It doesn't save any cookies. So the minute I close this browser, all that information is gone. And it is possible vaguely to recover it forensically. It's, it's pretty challenging, but it is there, unlike if I went to RWU from here. Now, if I go to RWU from Tor, a whole different thing happens. I still connect, and I'm still going to get to Roger Williams University from Tor. It's going to be a little slower because it's bouncing around. It's, but the speed is not because of Tor, though. The speed is because of this is a virtual machine, I think. It does take longer on tour because one, it's encrypted, and two, it's bouncing you know, through Latvia. I think it's going to connect. We'll see if it does. There it goes. It's, it just takes it a second to set up this relay, and then once the relay gets set up, it, it will actually connect. Now, for Roger Williams, I get pretty much the exact same information, but what Roger Williams just saw is something very, very different. On Roger Williams' end, they saw a connection come to their website from Latvia or wherever it's connected from now. It changes, too, so it, it updates itself. So Roger Williams did not see that a connection came from Rhode Island to their site. Now they see a connection coming to their site from another country. And maybe they get all excited because they think they're going to get some students from Latvia or something like that. Was it Dr. Doom from Latvia? I think Dr. Doom is from Latvia. Seems like that's true. But I don't know. I mean, okay, no comic books. No comic book references. All right, anyway, so that's Tor, and that is uh, incognito mode. Back to you guys in the studio. Thanks. There you have it. So that's basically a quick uh, overview of using Tor. Uh, one of the things to comment on is, as you may be saying, why would I use this? And I, I want to revisit again that the reason you would use this primarily, because we're all legitimate here, would be to uh, to protect your net neutrality information so that your uh, ISP couldn't uh, couldn't forward that. What do you what do you think about that, Russ? No, I I, I, th I think that's great. And and getting on the topic of net neutrality, I mean, and and I know you, you've talked about it before. We've talked about it before. It's um, there in the the biggest problem right now, or that has been since 2015, was when Comcast and Netflix went at it, and 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 in the first legal battle, basically Comcast wanted Netflix to pay them an additional one million dollars to to uh, prioritize the traffic that was going from Netflix over Comcast's network, uh, and Netflix said, "Heck no, I'm not. We're not doing that. That would set a precedent that would that would drive the world crazy because that would." That would begin, you know, the, the end of times for many of the internet people that that were talking about it. And because once you start prioritizing traffic based on uh, content, now what would happen with with startup organizations or companies that you know weren't the like the WalMarts of the world? I mean, now everything would become so prioritized and and so, you know, for these major companies that the that the small people would 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 fizzle out and fade away. So, I think that's really important yeah, for net I mean, neutrality. 
I mean, I mean, I agree with that. And I, and I think that that's one of the big issues. And I talked about net neutrality a lot next week. So I made one more video that's not as long, thankfully. Whew, I got a little long winded there <laughs> uh, to, to show you a, how Tor actually works. So what it's doing. So I'm going to cut back to me in another time. So a kind of bizarre temporal problem and let you see this video about how Tor actually works. Mm -hmm. Thanks, guys. So my favorite toy, you know I love it, it's Packet Tracer. I love this thing because it's so much fun to play with. You could actually set all this up and I didn't set all the different things up, but I want to show you an example of how Tor actually works. And we'll talk a little bit about incognito mode at the same time. So think about it like this. So you're over here at this place. This is your house or your office or wherever it is. 29.1.18.80, that's the ISP address. See if you can figure out what the significance of that number is. It has significance. You'll never figure it out, though. And whenever I do that, it's always too obscure, but it's, it's fun. It's not just a meaningless number I made up. Um, so, if you, you're connected to corporate ISP, so let's just first do two normal transactions. So, a normal transaction, use Chrome. You go from here to corporate ISP, to Wolfram and Hart ISP, to Ameritech ISP, to your daughter's kindergarten site. Cool. They see in their log 29.1.18.80 connected, Anything they send back, they can talk back and forth and so forth. When you log off here, you close Chrome. It's stored in your search engine or, or in the search history that you went to this site. Now, any cookies they set, any passwords you saved, any of that stuff is all on your machine. If you did this with incognito mode, when you close this browser, the history that you went to this site on your machine would be gone. Their log still shows you connecting, still shows whatever activity you did. Always going to be the case. If you go to Poker Stars, same thing. So now, corporate ISP could tell you that you went to your daughter's kindergarten site because they have it in their log. They could also tell that you went to Poker Stars. If you're sending unencrypted traffic to these sites, they could actually log that traffic if they wanted to. So this corporate ISP, and if you remember last week's show about net neutrality, this corporate ISP could actually sell that information to other people. So that you, that you have, maybe have a kid going to the school and you like to gamble online. So you have kind of a twisted existence. I don't know, I'm just kidding. Now, PokerStars also logged that, that number. Let's use incognito mode for a second. If you use incognito mode, PokerStars still knows you connected. They still know who you are if you logged in. They still have your information. Corporate ISP still knows who you are. They know that you went to Poker Stars, and they have a record of that transaction in the traffic. Your browser, however, has already forgotten all about it. So that's incognito mode. Now let's use Tor. If I use Tor browser to go to my daughter's kindergarten site, that traffic immediately sets up a connection between you and creepy, uh, is that the one, is it, no, it's this other one, you and guy who might be in a band. So corporate ISP sees you connect to guy who might be in a band, not to your daughter's kindergarten site. Once you connect to guy who might be in a band, a VPN is established between these two points. And now corporate ISP just sees you connected to guy who might be in a band, who has volunteered his node to be used by Tor. Guy who might be in a band's connection connects to the University of Grand Fenwick via a VPN. They connect to a server rack in a Chinese restaurant on 28th, and they connect to Ameritech ISP. And so your daughter's kindergarten site sees a connection come from the server rack in a Chinese restaurant on 28th. That's what's in their log. Now, if you are not anonymizing yourself and you connect there and you log in with your username and password, they still saw that a login came from Doug White. It just happened to come from a server rack in a Chinese restaurant on 28th Street. And that may confuse uh, some people some of the time, but they still have a record that you connected. Same thing if you connect to PokerStars. So if you decide to connect to PokerStars now, and, and, and if you did this right away, Tor may update and change the routing. So Tor says, okay, well now you connect to Creepy Beard Guy. 
and Creepy Beard Guy connects to the University of Grand Fenwick because that's a great big node, and, and that's a reference too if you don't get it. And the University of Grand Fenwick connects to Haxel or Cool Daddy, and they go to Ameritech and they go to PokerStar. And remember, this is all VPN, so your corporate ISP is going to show you had two connections: one to guy who might be in a band, which is just some IP address, and one to Creepy Beard Guy, which is just another IP address. All the other traffic is encrypted. But again, if you go to PokerStars using this circuitous connection, PokerStars will still see your login and they will still see your password. They will still see your credit card number. And anything you download from PokerStars will be here. If you are not using anonymous browser, now Tor actually does delete all that stuff if you have it set that way. So Tor would purge the browsing history. It would purge the fact that you connected to PokerStars. Does that mean there are other residuals of PokerStars in your system? Good luck with that. But that's how those two products work, just to give you a quick example with some funny names. Uh, there's a whole bunch of references here. So that's a reference. This is a reference. Um, this is actually a reference. And that is a reference. And this is actually a good restaurant. Thanks. Back to you guys. So there you have it. So looking at how Tor actually works with a bunch of obscure references to things that I found amusing. So anyway, the point of all this is that you can use browsers like Tor that disguise your traffic, even though they don't disguise the endpoints. Russ, you have any comments about that? I, I think you summed it up nicely. The videos worked very, very well. Um, you know, uh, just, you know, be careful when, if you decide to use Tor, be careful because nothing is 100 percent um, secure, as we saw with Dread, Pe Dread Pirate Roberts and in his uh, incarceration. Um, and, you know, just don't be stupid. Don't do stupid things. If, if it, you know, don't go to the Internet to buy drugs, in other words, or people. Well, well, I'm showing you legitimate reasons to use <laughs> Tor. Russ obviously is thinking about something else entirely. Yeah. But, yes, yeah, so don't do don't do what don't be like Dread Pirate Roberts <laughs> and, uh, and stay away from all that. So that about wraps it up for this week. We'll be back next week with another episode of Secure Digital Life. Hopefully I'll be in the studio next week and something weird happens. Russ has returned from his long trip to England to become a druid, and yeah. that's going to be it. I think we're done.